Happy Friday, everybody, and welcome into the Graham Lincoln McLean podcast presented by Ingalls, the official supermarket of Graham Lincoln McLean. Mac, Thanksgiving. Bye. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, my friend. Welcome to the Christmas season. I love that. Listen, here's the deal. My Christmas starts uh, the day after Halloween. Then we take a couple of days off, two or three days off, and then we start Christmas again. So you and I That's are very much on the same page, my friend. That's <laughs> right. And for some football fans, you know, Christmas, because it's rivalry week and rivalry Saturday is tomorrow. Right. So we have so many games to talk about here, Mac. I want to reference this. We currently have nine ACC teams that are already bowl eligible. Mac and I are going to be doing bowl previews galore. So get ready, <laughs> y'all. Florida State, Louisville, NC State, Georgia Tech, North Carolina, Clemson, Boston College, Duke, and Miami are all bowl eligible. And this week, if Virginia Tech beats Virginia, and if Syracuse beats Wake Forest, there will be 11 ACC Crazy. teams bowling. 11 out of 14. I don't think that's ever happened. That's <laughs> not bad. No, so. uh, it, 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 it does sound like some type of record. Uh, we'll, we'll have to get stats and research kind of on that to figure that out. But what a great accomplishment, you know, for these teams and to get to go to the postseason and, and then play some some great teams, some good caliber teams. I love the bowl games that obviously the ACC is associated with. So we'll uh, we'll get to crank it up, KG. It's going to be fun. Mac, before we get to a message from Ingles, tell me about your Thanksgiving spread. How did mm. it look? So good. It was just beautiful. Listen, you guys saw it all over social media. We'll pop it up some more. It'll probably be there throughout the weekend. Content for days. Uh, but we, So we did three turkeys. You might see a, a fourth and fifth. I don't really count those, so we are cooking some extra ones. Uh, we cooked some extra ones for our friends. Uh, so this is – so three big turkeys and then two where it's just like the breasts and a little bit more that pops took over to the base. So we're rolling, we're rolling some wood over here. Okay. Burning it up, cranking it up. And, uh, I did a little experimenting with those. So one, I did Texas style, actually quote unquote, whatever that means, uh, KG, where I kind of did like a Mayo base. And then you, you know, you kind of do the, the different, uh, rubs and, and spices on there. And then we did another with kind of like a, a honey whiskey glaze. It, it was really good. Ooh. It was really good. So, Anyway, you know how we get down? It's big time. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you the best part about this, you know, kind of Thanksgiving shenanigans here is Khaki Mac, out of the kindness of her heart, made an extra sweet potato pie that I can take on the road and give to the guys at the huddle so they oh. can have a little sampling of the sweet potato pie. <laughs> Khaki's the goat. I mean, there's... She is the goat. That's what she does. She's a woman of many talents. She, she's a <laughs> Well, let's get to a message from Ingalls. And then we got to get to these games. This is so beautiful. I don't know how you do it. We just got this pie from Ingles. Well. Happy Thanksgiving from Ingalls. Mac, let's get into it. We have rivalry games galore to discuss. Let us, let's start here with uh, North Carolina and NC State. UNC travels to number 22, NC State. UNC is a two and a half point favorite at this point. 8 p.m. on ACC Network. Mac and the boys will be there all day, so make sure you tune in. Both teams are eight and three. There's so much at stake here to keep the possibility of a 10-win season alive. Obviously, the rivalry aspect of this is huge. These teams hate each other. The last couple of <laughs> games have been very close and have come down to the wire. And, you know, I think the big question here is, can NC State somewhat replicate defensively what Clemson did to North Carolina? Because hmm. if you can limit North Carolina like that, even with Amar and Hampton going off, you have a really good chance to win if you're NC State. So I think it comes down to that defense, Mac. Yeah, no, I, I think you're you're absolutely correct, and and going to be fascinating to see. And, and you mentioned the rivalry aspect. Uh, I, I saw a quote from Coach Dave Doran the other day where you know, he was saying there's a lot of implications that this win you know can help with with you know bowl seating and, and different games and you know rankings within the ACC kind of standings there and you know taking a step for an, a ten win season, all these different things. And then he goes, 
And I don't care about any of that. I just want to beat North Carolina. <laughs> and I said, yes. Yeah. I said, That's amazing. It's amazing. And, and, you know, both these guys, I know Coach Mac Brown the exact same way uh, with in-state rivals, you know, how passionate he was about beating Duke and, you know, hearing mm-hmm. kind of his thought process on that. So it means a ton to everybody. And the fact that we're going to be there, it's a night game. This environment is going to be bonkers. I, I cannot wait to see it, just how juiced up, you know, the, the NC State fans are there. Uh, because it's one of the best environments in the ACC. I've, I've said that for many years, even when I was playing, um, and people didn't quite get it. But now I think Carter Finley's starting to get some respect that it you know, really deserves. And, and I think you're absolutely right, KG, what you kind of said about, you know, can they kind of replicate what Clemson did? And, and I think the answer is is outcome-wise, potentially, but necessarily what it looks like, you know, they, they've got to do some, you know, just different things because of personnel, because of who they have. But you know, they bring pressure and they're going to send it and they're going to try to confuse Drake and, and, and you know, kind of heat him up um, and, and all these different things that, that he can do um, and just try to get that process going. So uh, excited to see it. You know, that matchup similar to last week where I said, you know, the UNC versus the Clemson defense was the matchup that I really wanted to see. Same deal here where I, I just it's going to be fireworks and it's going to be a very fun chess match. We talk so much about Drake May, and of course, he is going to be a main storyline in this game. But I think Omar and Hampton is the X factor. And frankly, look, I said this when we talked about the Clemson UNC game. If he doesn't fumble twice, does that sure. game go a bit differently? I think it does. And he still was just bonkers from you know a production perspective. Mac, I want to hit you with this stat. Uh-oh. Omar and Hampton has run for 100-plus yards in six straight games, becoming the first UNC player to do that since 1970. He has also tied for the national lead by averaging 128.6 yards to go with 15 rushing scores. So Hmm. as great as Drake May is, and he might be the number one pick in the draft, the best player on the field, at least just from a production standpoint, Matt, I'm not saying the best prospect. I'm saying the most productive, at least as of late, has been Omarion Hampton. So do you think that Omarion – here's my question. Can Omarion <laughs> Hampton get his and NC State still win, like Clemson did? That, that is the question. That is the interesting thing. And maybe most consistent, right? Maybe the most consistent maybe piece right. of this offense, especially lately. I mean, he, he's been on fire. Um I think the key is just having both of them go off. I mean, that's what you need, obviously. It's what everyone wants. But finding that perfect perfect rhythm of is it is it 20 carries for Hampton? Is it, you know, 35 throws for Drake? You know, what is it? You know, where they're able to balance that out and, and feel like they're at their best. Um, I, I think that they're still one of those teams that, you know, they kind of dictate tempo what they want to do offensively. You know, if they want to throw it, they're going to set that up however they want. If they want to run it, do kind of the same thing there. So, you know, I, I think that – I think to win, you know, Drake's going to have to throw for almost 300 yards and some scores. Yeah. I, I don't think that they can run their way to a, to a victory here. Um, just kind of, you know, how the defense is built, things of that nature. Um, and, again, they're going to heat it up and, and try to make it uncomfortable. So, yeah, I, I think that Drake has to have the better day if they get this W or to get this W. And, you know, he didn't play really well against NC State last year, and Peyton Wilson is still there, and a lot of this defense is still there. On the other side, can NC State's offense do enough, right? They The last couple weeks, they've put it together with Bernard Armstrong and using Casey Concepcion in every single possible uh, way. Can they do enough? Plus, this game's at home, night game. As you mentioned, Carter Finley is going to be crazy. I still think there are some elements – to NC State's offense where you're not quite sure what they're going to do and how they're going to do it with Concepcion that even though they definitely have the lesser quarterback, it it's really hard to prepare for, Matt, what NC State's going to do offensively. Right. No, I, I agree. And, and you know, obviously the, this defense for North Carolina has has struggled, you know, in the, the second, you know, third of the season. You know, I'll, I'll kind of give that. It's a little bit more than half. Um and yeah, I mean, th- these guys are going to be physical. They're going to run the football. They're going to show you a bunch of different looks. I, I was just kind of preparing for this game and looking at a couple of different things. And, you know, I just kept noticing 10 in a different place. Casey is lined up at so many different positions. Like he is truly right now 
it feels like to me all the way unlocked what this offense should and could have been early and often. And, and kind of with, when you look at Coach Robert and I, he loves to have one, two, three guys that he can just move around. And right now he has one really talented in KC Concepcion and line them up out wide, line them in the slot, line them at three back position, tailback, fullback, quarterback. And you know, he threw a touchdown last week. This dude truly is Mr. Do-It-All for this team. And, and then you add in Brennan's legs uh, and, and obviously his content, you know, be, being able to throw the ball. It's, it, it's been fun to see because for a couple of reasons, number one, it's just dangerous. And this is exactly why, you know, coach hired, uh, you know, an eye there to be his offensive coordinator. He wanted to be multiple. He wanted to be very difficult to prepare for. Um, and then I'm excited because Brennan, you know, storming back and, and you know, kind of putting a nice exclamation point on his career here when everyone thought that it was probably over. And this would be, you know, the last time that he would play when, when he took those snaps and, and got benched. So it, it's great to see that. It's a fun story. You don't love kind of how it had to happen, but the moral of the story is he was ready for his opportunity. If it ever happened again, he could have been a jerk. He could have quit on the team when he got benched. And instead, he just went to work every day, did the best that he could, whatever that role was that he was asked of. And now when it's back his, man, what an opportunity to go out there and lead this team to potential double-digit wins for the first time in a long time and only the second time ever. <laughs> like, that's so true. A lot of guys would have quit, would have just yeah. kind of said, like, actually physically quit. We've seen that right. happen when you lose a job. So yeah. shout yeah. out to Bill Armstrong for that. And here's my other note for NC State. NC State is 3-0 and in November for the first time since 2008. I wow. think they keep it going. I'm taking NC State plus two and a half in this game. <laughs> At home, I just, I feel like NC State is playing much more inspired football right now. Yeah, I think that's a great way to, to kind of classify it. And I'm right there with you, KG. I think this defense is electric. The, the environment is going to be hostile. Uh, it's going to be loud. It's going to be aggressive. And I think that that's going to directly translate and correlate to the field. I mean, I, I think these guys make plays. They force Carolina into uncomfortable situations and ultimately survive. Now, I'm not saying it won't be close, not saying it's not going to be uncomfortable for both teams at times, uh, but I do think NC State figures out a way to win. And honestly, I think this game this game might be in the mid to high 30s uh, mm -hmm. between each team. When you look at it kind of going back and forth, um, I don't I don't really think a track meet, which is, it sounds crazy what I'm about to say, but I don't think a track meet favors either team. You know, there's sometimes where you're like, oh, this team does not want to have to play catch up. What we've seen from NC State the last couple of weeks, they, they can be right in there with that, especially yeah. the defense that they're playing. For sure. It, it's so interesting to think about where the season has turned from the beginning of the year when UNC got as high as number 10. NC State was really struggling, I believe, four and three, and then now where they are. Yeah. They just shouldn't. totally switched, switched yeah. roles and kind of ascending right now. It's a long season. Okay, we talked a lot about this game on our Wednesday episode, so if you missed that, go listen to it. Number 24, Clemson at South Carolina, 7.30 p.m. on SEC Network. Clemson is a seven-point favorite. Again, we, we get into a lot of it on Wednesday, but to me, my biggest factor in this game and my biggest concern for Clemson is the fact that it's on the road. And Clemson has looked like a completely different football team at home yeah. and you know yeah. Clemson has been good at home in all the Dabo era but I feel like this <laughs> is much more accentuated and much more of a difference and they've played three straight at home so they got to go on the road they got to go to a very hostile place and the turnovers of course Mac that's going to be the other big key I found this really interesting stat because it, it really pertains to Clemson South Carolina is nine and three when forcing at least one fumble since mm. the 2021 season so, and South Carolina, you know, they're probably not nine and three when doing X stat in anything else. So <laughs> yeah, let's just re-up. The turnovers and it being on the road, that's the only reason that would give me pause to say Clemson won't win or Clemson won't cover, which I'm not saying yeah. this time, but that's the thing that gives me pause. Yeah. And, and I think it's, um, it's just taking that next step, right. And, and proving that your team is, is flipped things around, turn things around and really been a, a different team since that Notre Dame game. And, and, you know, feel pretty confident in that. But like you said, going on the road, hostile environment, uh, you know, it, it's going to be tough. You're going to have to weather that storm. A lot of young kids, uh, you know, on this team that are going to get the opportunity to play a young quarterback that this is probably 
this is probably the toughest environment that he's going to have to be in, uh, you know, being on the, on this road game here. So, you know, there is going to be a lot of things that are different that they're seeing for the first time. Um, you know, obviously South Carolina ha- has some really, you know, good players sprinkled throughout their roster. You know, when, when I look at the wide receiver, you know, going for over 1,200 yards and, and just a big time guy, uh, you know, 6'3", 230, uh, reminds me a lot of Alshon Jeffrey, the things that he can do from a playmaking perspective. But then that's kind of it. Like it drops off significantly after that. So I said this on Wednesday, I'll say it again. I would love to see Nate Wiggins follow him, travel around the entire field. You know, where's 17? Like you need to know and you need to be on that guy. And then we'll kind of set our coverage based off of that, set our defense after the fact of what you can kind of do there. There's really no run game, you know, at all that you've seen from a consistent basis from South Carolina. So does that mean Clemson tries to play it a little bit differently? Do do you have, you know, less linebackers on the field, more DBs, and and try to look at that three safety look that we had seen or saw from them have unbelievable success against Drake May last year in the ACC championship and kind of have Wade Wood as flying around. Now he's gained a little bit of weight. He looks more like a linebacker. I don't know if he could move the same as he could last year. So it it will be interesting kind of that chess match and, and to see, how does Clemson try to dictate what South Carolina can do or what they want to do? Uh, because if y'all remember last year, there were a lot of big plays for South Carolina yeah. in the passing game, like there were for a, for a handful of people, to be quite honest. This defensive backfield has dramatically improved from what we saw last year and has been an absolute strength for this team. And then, you, again, you have guys like Jeremiah Trotter, Barrett Carter uh, flying around, and can they do enough you know, to, to be the linebackers in there? Or even if you throw a three-down lineman look, you know, at them and, and try to contain that way. So I, I'm going to be very interested to see the approach uh, from the defensive side of the ball, KG, and, and just what Clemson wants to do there. And you have a very desperate South Carolina team. They're five and six. Yeah. Trying to go bowling. As I yeah. said on Wednesday, this game would completely save the year for them. To beat Clemson and to win six games, that would be a huge, you know, turnaround for this season. They're coming off a game where they – Beat Kentucky by three points. They did get a win, but as you mentioned, Mac, they did not win the ball at all. And right. that's something that I don't think Clemson respects right now. So we'll see if they start the game like that. Because Rattler can hurt you. And Rattler did hurt Clemson sure. last year. I mean, you've, yeah. you've got that revenge factor, too, of the loss last year for Clemson that I'm sure Dabo is bringing up in the facility this week, Mac. Just once or twice, once or twice. And, and, you know, honestly, looking at it, you know, what what do you want to do? How do you want to, you know, approach this game, you know, on the, on the offensive side of the ball, if you're Clemson too, and, and understanding what you've been doing lately, running the ball very effectively, uh, getting the tight end, ball, tight end involved, getting the middle of the field involved from a passing perspective. Um, and, and Clemson also, you know, in these last couple of games, they've kind of taken out the RPO. You know, they, they've made it much mm-hmm. less – uh, run pass read for Cade and more so just get through your progressions. One, two, three, where am I throwing the ball? And, and I, I think that certainly has helped. Um, and again, that big offensive line up front, you know, since the Notre Dame game, kind of, you know, plugging and playing a couple of different guys, but pretty much have the same core there, you know, that they feel really good about. So I, I am fascinated. And, and you talk about, you know, the revenge and, and getting back to where, you know, Clemson wants to be and should be in this rivalry. Uh, I, I have to think that's going to be on the top of some people's mind. Yes, and of course, Mac, always a less chance for a fumble when you take out the RPA. My <laughs> last crazy stat here with this game, the number 20, Mac, if I gave you the number 20 as it pertains to Clemson season, what would you say that signifies? No clue. Okay. <laughs> it signifies three things, actually. Clemson this season oh has 20 passing touchdowns, okay. 20 rushing touchdowns, and 20 turnovers. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That's, crazy. That's bizarre. <laughs> That's, That's bizarre. Let's That's uh crazy. let's try to separate some of those guys. Let's try to yeah. separate two of those from the third. That'd be nice. Yeah. We know turnovers will matter. <laughs> I'm gonna take on the road, it gives me a little pause, but I'm gonna take Clemson minus seven. And I think I know what Come you're on. Doing. Come on, we're back. We're back. We're doing it. I think the Clemson Tigers win by double digits. Um I think they get that place pretty quiet. I'm feeling good about what they're doing. And just more so, you know, it's, it's, listen, South Carolina's had to rotate a ton of offensive linemen. They've had a bunch of injuries up there. You know, you just think that Clemson's going to be able to take advantage of that and, and to really get it going in a positive way. Yeah, I think so. All right, let's talk Kentucky Louisville, the Governor's Cup. 
Kentucky at number 10, Louisville, noon on ABC. Also a seven-point spread. Louisville is a seven-point favorite. I think, unfortunately, a noon kick. You know? I, I agree. Kentucky to be a road team for a noon kick. How packed will that place be? Got to get in early. Mm-hmm. It's tough to start drinking bourbon at 9 a.m., but hopefully these Louisville fans do that. The Wildcats have won four straight in this rivalry. This has been a game that Louisville has not won in quite some time. Kentucky has not won five straight in this series since winning the first seven games of the series way back Mm. in the day. And, of course, Louisville has not won the Governor's Cup since 2017. So it's been a long time. But you have a new coaching staff in Jeff Brom that is putting so much emphasis on this game. He is a Louisville guy. He despises Kentucky, I'm sure. So you've got that. And Louisville is feeling great about themselves right now. Kentucky coming off a really bad loss to South Carolina. But Kentucky is already bowl eligible, Mac. I think that does matter. I'm not sure. They're desperate. Sure, this is a rivalry game. They want to win it. But they're not looking for that sixth win. I I just want to throw that out because I think it matters a little bit. Yeah, no, I I think it it certainly does. And it's going to matter in a lot in these games that we're talking about here in a second in in the speed round. And, you know, I I think when you're just – you're looking at this matchup and you think, okay, you know, how much is history going to matter? How much is history going to play a part in this thing? And and just the Wildcats have had a bit of a, a stranglehold on this game and, you know, really being able to beat Louisville and, you know, even games that you thought, maybe not as much as this one. This one's, I, I think, especially from the matchup predictor, a little bit more one-sided. But a couple of years ago, you know, you thought Louisville was really going to be able to hand it to these guys, and they just didn't. They couldn't get it done on the field. And and so now, is, is this the year? And I think having Coach Brom you know, being a guy that can really, you know, overemphasize this game. And, and I'm putting words in his mouth. I have no idea how he feels about it, but I can't imagine he likes Kentucky at all. And, you know, having played there, growing up in Louisville, now being the head coach, like, I don't think he likes the color blue too much, okay? So he, he's going to be able to really, you know, rile those guys up, get them going, where I think the previous regime could not do that. I mean, I just think it, it just didn't, they didn't, it didn't matter as much as it does to Coach Brom and, and this staff. A lot of Louisville guys, a lot of, you know, Kentucky guys, the state of Kentucky on this, you know, team here on this staff. So I think they get them jacked up. Uh, you know, I, I think this is one of those games where you see the Louisville defense really stand tall and make some big-time plays. And, you know, they kind of cruise into the ACC championship re- feeling really good. So I'm rocking with the cards here as well. You say cruise. You think Louisville wins this game pretty handily? You know, I, I think – I'll say at least double digits, but I don't know. Just what I've seen from Kentucky lately is it's, it's not the same team. They're, they're not mm-hmm. super explosive. Um, and again, I think Louisville has some good juice going. I think they want to prove a point, um, you know, especially going into this, this ACC championship because, you know, with the JT injury, a lot of people are saying, oh, well, you know, no playoff for the ACC. I think they want to say, well, what if we do this? What if we run this table? You know, are we a team that now you feel a lot better about um, and what an opportunity they have? So I think they play quite motivated and, uh, you know, double digits I feel good about. It's a good point. You know, there was a one-loss AC champion with a loss to Pitt that made the playoff in 2016. <laughs> I've heard of them. They were a pretty good we'll team. Won the Natty, I think, that year. The one thing that worries me, Mac, is Kentucky is second in the SEC in rush defense. They're actually a very good defense against the run. And we know how much Louisville likes to run it. But I think Plummer's coming off his best game in the Louisville uniform. Right. And, and you're right. I think Louisville is so locked in on what they can accomplish this year. Mm-hmm. No distractions. I'm going to take Louisville minus seven. I don't think it's maybe as big of a margin as you, mm. but I think they cover and win. And the way this game has gone, I wouldn't even be surprised if it goes <laughs> completely the other way. I, w- I, wouldn't be catch. I really wouldn't. All right, before we get to the speed round, let's finish with – um, Florida, Florida State in this big game breakdown. Number five, Florida State is at Florida, seven o'clock on ESPN. FSU is a six and a half point favorite, would probably be more if Jordan Travis was playing. He, of course, is not. Florida State has won 17 games in a row at this point, and Florida has lost four in a row. Florida is struggling <laughs> big time, and not compared to Kentucky, which, you know, these SEC teams, a lot of them back around five and six, sounds about right. Um, this team's five and six. They need this game to get to a bowl if you're Florida. Yeah. Much like South Carolina in these rivalry games. So does that desperation factor in? You've got Tate Rotomaker, 
making his first start, I believe, since 2021 at Florida. And then you've got a young guy for Florida, too, who's making his first start with Graham Mertz out. So Florida State's going to win, Mac. I really feel like they win this game. I'm not sure what it looks like, but Mm. I think they get it done. You know, I I think – I think what you want to see here is is obviously a a clean, well managed game for Modern Maker. And, and you know, at the end of the day, this rivalry is crazy. I, I know that that Florida's five and six. I get that. I get they're not a great team. I know they're on a horrible losing streak right now. You know, losing four in a row. But none of that matters in this rivalry game. I promise. I mean, this is very similar uh, to Clemson, Carolina, where just win that game. You know, and and your fans go nuts. You feel great. Uh, it's all kinds of juice in the off season, and I, I think that's exactly what Florida's thinking: is we want to spoil this season. We want to take this away from these boys. We we don't want them even sniffing, you know, the college football playoff. Mm-hmm. And if you're FSU, just get it done. Just just execute at a high level. Do your job. Don't get some silly penalties. Definitely don't get pre snap penalties. I'm sure the swamp is is going to be bonkers night game there. Um, you know, very passionate fan base. But, you know, I would love to just see Tate manage the game, get the ball to his playmakers, you know, even early, like let's run some screens, let's run some quick game, see, let him see himself completing passes, you know, I think is is very important there. And then the other guys, I've said this a bunch, KG, but everybody has to step up. Like Keon Coleman has to turn into Superman. Like he he was so great all year long. He has to take it to another level. He has to get open more by a wider margin he has to secure the catch get after it afterwards get that yak and and get in the end zone johnny wilson catch the ball consistently those big tight ends get in space like get in his throwing windows and of course those running backs and offensive line when you get the opportunity you just got to go like i I would love to see a total team effort you know just kind of elevate and and take care of their guy and and, you know number one play for jt but number two play for everything that's still in front of you like understand that these folks might be trying to take you out, you know, this committee putting you at five, whatever, uh, you know, force the hand, just win and, and you're in, you, you'll handle business there. So that's what I really would love to see from these guys. Um, I think Trey Benson can have a really big day. You know, Florida has not had a great running defense all year. Can, can he go and, and I don't know about 200, but you know, 150, you know, have a really impressive day. He's only, you know, gone over hundred yards once this year, I believe rushing the football. And that was for that 200 piece against Virginia Tech. So, you know, is he going to become a feature of this offense simply because, you know, Jordan Travis isn't there? And I know he he was ready for that and will accept that. Um, but it is going to be a different looking offense and just kind of find out how quickly, you know, are they going to be able to adapt? You know, I think Florida State can change everybody's perception with this game. If they go yeah. in there and blow out Florida and they look really good, think about it, Matt. We've seen a team lose their shining quarterback and go on to win the national title in the playoff era. Ohio State did yeah. that. Yeah. Is yeah. your team good enough around Tate Rotomaker? And I think mm-hmm. the biggest thing for him is he has to take care of the ball. Florida State only has five turnovers all year, which is crazy. Right. So take care right. of the football. And Florida's pass defense is really bad. The Gators have allowed six 100-yard receivers in their past five games. So mm. this is a get-right game, Mac, for Florida State. <laughs> and for Tate Rotomaker. You know, a pretty good pass defense to go up against in your first big game, first big start, but also a tough environment. So, yeah, I, I'm going to take Florida State minus six. And a half. I think we're we're really agreeing on these, which I don't love. Go on, man. Uh, you, you know, it's it's never a good thing. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I, th- I think the Knolls get it done. I, I think, you know, I believe in Coach's system. I believe in in the culture that he has in place. I believe in the guys surrounding. Jordan Travis and now Tate Rodemaker. And, and I think that they're going to step up. I, I don't think this is, you know, an LSU situation where, you know, that guy does everything for your team. Um, and, and other guys will, will emerge. Other guys will step up, be ready to go and uh, really help them and, and need to see that from the defense as well. You know, as you mentioned, Florida has a backup in his also, you know, he's seeing the Knowles as his first game ever. Like, let's go, let's make this, you know, terrible for him, a bad experience. And, you know, really get them second guessing because Florida's they have a lot to play for, as you mentioned, postseason. Billy Napier, I think, is coaching for his job. Uh, you know, all these different things where they're going to be motivated. You just have to take that away and take it away quickly. All right, Mac, let's get to our speed round here. First of all, Miami at Boston College, noon today on ABC. Miami's an eight and a half point favorite. 
Mac, there's nothing I trust about this Miami team. I think it's gone that, up a little bit. It's at nine and a half now. Nine and a half. Even Big better. Time. Thank you. Even better for me. <laughs> I and you. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to take Boston College plus nine and a half. I just don't trust Miami. And BC's been a lot better yeah. at home. Sleepy, even though they get mad when I say that, but it's true. Sleepy environment at BC at noon. Give me the Eagles plus nine and a half. Both teams are already bowling. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I think two you know, emotional games back-to-back for Miami. They had to muster up everything, right, to be in those. And you're going up to a place that's going to be around 40 degrees at kickoff. Ooh. Uh, it, it's going to be cold. It's not going to be fun. It's the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, I, I don't know how interested, you know, Miami is going to be, uh, to, to be in that game. So yeah, g- give me BC, maybe not quite outright, but nine and a half, way too many points. I, I feel great about that. Agreed. So Mac and I keep agreeing and here's what to say people. I'm 42 and 35. Mac is 43 and 34. So these games are going to be huge, and we, we cannot. Gotta flip. Hey, here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. I'll start going first on the rest of these. So if you want to just, you know, if you want to just be competitive and flip something, you can. We'll see. All right. Number <laughs> one, Georgia at Georgia Tech, seven thirty p.m. ABC. Georgia's a twenty-four point favorite. Last I saw, Mac. What are your thoughts here? Yeah, I, I think Georgia continues to roll. They're on a war path right now, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I know Georgia Tech gave them everything they needed and more last year, uh, you know, in this game. But I think Georgia, with the passer that they have in Carson Beck, uh, a guy that can absolutely sling it around, uh, they, I think they continue that. I think they take those points. I think they get it done. I'm rocking with the dogs, finishing on a super high note going into the SEC championship. I agree, Mac. We do not oh. disagree. <laughs> and look, here's the thing. Last year, Georgia Tech kept it close early, and Georgia still covered. So yeah. Georgia – has been covering like crazy lately. I think Georgia covers, but who knows? Maybe the Yellow Jackets could shock the world. But Georgia Tech is already bowl eligible, so they're they're good in that regard. Huge step in the right direction for Georgia Tech. No question. Virginia Tech at Virginia, three thirty p.m. ACCN. Virginia Tech's two and a half point favorite. Mac, I am riding. Oh, what's it now? What I just wrote these it's down. At three. It's at three. It's at three. The lines are moving, people. <laughs> wow. Virginia Tech a three point favorite. Mac, I am. You know, dance with the one that brung you, Virginia. You have no way. good things for me this year. I am taking the Who's plus three yeah. at home in Charlottesville. Virginia Tech coming off a really tough game. Virginia coming off a win. Give me the Who's, baby. Let's go. All right. You you would be right, correct. You would be correct once in the past 20 years if you picked the Who's. So let's see if you can go for two, KG. Let's okay. see if you can go for two. I'm going with the Hokies strictly because of what I just said there. They, they just, for whatever reason, they, they own this rivalry. And, uh, you know, I think certainly Virginia keeps it close. Uh, this is a three-point game for a reason. Uh, but I'm, I'm going with the Hokies. I think they pull it out. They're going bowling another game. Yeah. They're going to be super motivated because uh, of that. And I think uh, Coach Pry and company get a lot of fun momentum going into the offseason for recruiting purposes. A lot more pressure on Virginia Tech in this game. Sure, sure. And our Virginia. Keep that in mind. Pitt at Duke, noon on ACC Network. Duke has struggled as of late. This game is at Duke. Pitt is actually feeling pretty good themselves after the Boston College game. This game yeah. is not going to make sense. I am taking Pitt plus six. You're welcome. Oh, are you really? Gosh. Mm-hmm. All right. Here we go, KG. Here we go. I'm rocking with the Blue Devils. Um, you know, they've been a little bit different team at home, uh, which is yeah. interesting and fascinating. Uh, I, I think they get back on track here. I know what Pittsburgh just did, you know, to, to a, a, the number one rushing offense in the ACC. But a lot of that is the quarterback. And, and if you get that contained, you get that guy throwing the ball, whatever, Duke can run the ball very effectively with three running backs. And, and I think they go back to that. You know, they threw it like 40-plus times last week, which yeah. I think was a little bit too much of an overcorrection. You know, I was excited that they were going to sling it around a little bit. I think that was just way too much. You, you have to stick to your bread and butter running the football. So if we saw anything like a – you know, 30, 35 rush to pass, you know, I'd be cool with that. So we'll see. I think Duke runs their way to, to a, a touchdown win here. I'm taking the Blue Devils. Mm. Uh, I am putting my faith and my season in Virginia and Pitt, which is a scary thought, but I'm apparently <laughs> doing it. Our last game at Wake Forest at Syracuse. Syracuse is a three-point favorite, 2 p.m. on the CW. This game 
trying to predict this game. What does Syracuse play like after their coach just got fired? They have a bowl game on the line, but how yeah. motivated are these guys? Like, did they want Dino to go? I mean, and then Wake right. coming off a beat down by Notre Dame. They're a disaster. We got Dave Clawson talking about, you know, Sam Hartman loved us more than you, Notre Dame, blah, blah, blah. I have no idea what to do here. I'm just going to take Syracuse yeah. on the street, but I feel terrible yeah. about the game. Uh, yeah, I, I am too. And, and that was so weird, by the way, talking about Coach Clawson saying all that. Like, why Why even comment on it? Like, who cares? Like, just keep it to basically yourself. Basically say, like, basically, okay, this is what, right? This is the analogy. Sam Hartman left you for a, a – Sam Hartman's 50, and he left you for a 25-year-old super, super beautiful girl, right? Like, that's what happened. And <laughs> But you gave Sam Hartman children, right? Like, you gave sure. him three kids. <laughs> you, you ruined your body, right, by having these children for him. What? You were married for 25 years, and he loved, He really loved you, but he had a midlife crisis, and yeah. he left you for this 25-year-old chick. <laughs> and you're mad and bitter, and you're basically saying he's never loved you. Yeah. He loved me, yeah. but he is with you now. This, uh, this sounds like a Taylor Swift song in a couple years. I think Maybe this is coming. I think this is happening. Look, now, this is a tale as old as time. Tale as old as yes. time. It is. It is. You know, we see it throughout history and it's unfortunate and it's not fair. It's unbelievable. Um, I'm rocking with Cuse. I, I think they're going to be motivated. I think it's going to be us versus the world type mentality. You fired our coach. We're going to show you why, you know, we're, we're still a team and to go bowling. You know, I, I think that those last two games I mentioned that I think it's important. I, I think it's a motivating factor and I think teams want to do that. So I, I think they get it done here. Wake just man get get to next year right yeah. like just move on. It's been a brutal four game stretch for those guys, and uh, I think it rounds out here with a fifth. So we got a little bit of disagreement, KG. A lot of agreement. It's going to be interesting. Uh, do, do you catch me? Do you pass me? Or do we tie this thing up going into the last game of the season? That that would be kind of fun, actually. My, I hope that happens. my season is in the hands of Anthony Calandria and Nate Yarn. <laughs> Come on, man. Wow. Super fun. <laughs> I feel good about it. Oh, yeah. gosh. I feel good about these leftovers, KG. I'm about to go Ooh. handle that. Uh, appreciate you guys tuning in. Hope you had an awesome Thanksgiving. Big weekend ahead of us. Rivalry week. Post up on the couch. Get to the stadium. Whatever you're doing. But watch some daggum football. And let's have fun. Uh, it's crazy. This season went by so fast. We'll, we'll dial it all up next week and wrap it up and, and start talking about championship games and playoff and You'll get into bowl season. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Big shout out to our friends over at Ingles, but we need some help from you guys. We need you to go over to YouTube, subscribe, jump on this channel, leave some comments. It's always fun to see those. Uh, and of course, the OGs over on Apple Podcasts as well. Rate, review, subscribe. We'd greatly appreciate that. But until next time, we'll see y'all.